Oh, hello, hello, people. <laughs> okay, um, I need you to also all make sure that you have a piece of paper with you. I did ask that somebody made sure that that was the case. So if anybody can just, just grab a piece of paper, it doesn't have to be anything in particular. Okay, and right, so I am going to start and I'm going to hope that I can share the screen. And okay. there we go. Okay, can everybody see that? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so I am an early years training consultant. I am passionate about uh, what early years should be, um, and probably have come across some of you before. Um, and when Eleanor asked me to potentially be a speaker at this conference, I was absolutely delighted. I do tend to get a little bit animated, so I'm hoping that the tea won't go flying when I start doing all this. Um, but what I'm going to say to you today is not necessarily just about um, the arts, uh, although that's obviously our focus, but I just think that the whole idea of creativity in early years and beyond is really fundamental to how teaching at the moment should be, um, especially going forward into the, um, the workplace that those children are going to go into. Uh, they're going to go into a workplace that we can't even imagine. Um, and that workplace is going to need them to be able to think creatively, to act creatively, um, and to be able to tap into their inner creativity. So I think more than ever, this is really, really important. So um, I'm going to hopefully just spend 20 minutes um, talking about, uh, as close to as I can get it, talking about creativity in early years and hope that it makes some sense. So um, bear with me two seconds. Okay, so those of you who are familiar with the framework that we have to work with in early years will know that the revised framework still has expressive arts and design, you, uh, and it's still there for the time being, um, and we will hold on to it for as long as we possibly can, um, because apart from anything else, I think it's fundamental to how the rest of the EYFS gets accessed. Um, but I did want to just for the sake of this particular speech, this, this particular conference just go over where um, the points that I'm going to talk about are really important within that particular framework. So it says about being imaginative within the framework and it says that children will use what they've already learned about media and materials in origin, original ways. So there's an element of what they've already done and being able to revisit about um, having access to a wide range of material, a wide range of media, and also having original thoughts and original thinking. And that's really important that I personally, I really don't like a system that brings out children that are like dog food cans where they're all supposed to be squished into the same can. So it's really important to know that this is within our legal framework. So we can use that as our leverage for why we do what we do when it comes to early years. And even more importantly, it does say that children represent their own ideas, thoughts and feelings through design, technology, art, music, role play and stories. So it, for me, it's not the scope of the ideas and how they use those ideas. It's about the fact that it's about their own ideas. It's not about us as practitioners um, and about what we think, it's about the individual children being individuals. And that's where what I'd really like to do is to ask you all really nicely to take the piece of paper that you have. And my quest for you for the next two, two minutes or 30 seconds or however long it takes is for you to build a paper aeroplane. OK, so I want you to build a paper aeroplane. I'm giving you no instructions. I don't, I don't know what piece of paper you've got with you, but I want you to build a paper aeroplane. Look at the concentration on everybody's faces. It's brilliant. 
I'm trying to get as many of you into my screen as I possibly can to see you making these aeroplanes. Fantastic. See, some of you have already finished. <laughs> Some of you are concentrating. Right. Okay. So what I want you to do is I'd like you to just hold up your paper aeroplane for everybody else to see. Okay. Now, what you can see is, I don't know how many people Ellen has admitted at the moment, but there was like, they were in the tens when I first, when I first came on. Um, Oh, hold them up so everybody can see. So all I've done is gave you an instruction to make something. I gave you an instruction to make a paper aeroplane. I will lay money on the fact that not one single aeroplane on any of your pictures is the same as anybody else's. Okay, because what happened is that you all used your prior knowledge so if you've made hundreds of paper aeroplanes before because your children love paper aeroplanes or I'm stereotyping here, but like me, if you're a mum of boys, you, you make paper aeroplanes on a regular basis. Um, you will go for your default that you know that works. Um, some of you might have seen something that works and decided they're going to try and copy it. Some of you may have had a very clear idea of what you wanted to do from the very outset and gone with that. Some of you may have had a slight idea and have adapted your idea as you went along to make your aeroplane. And some of you will have got to the very end and been pleased with what you've created. Or some of you, having just seen everybody else's, might decide that you want to change a few things or to modify it, to keep making it slightly different. And the reason that I make people do that is to show you that we are all individuals in the way that we think, and we are all individuals in the way that we express our creativity. So some people will have gone for an aeroplane that is very streamlined and that will go fastest or the longest or the furthest. And some of you will get really uh, creative about putting little flaps on it or putting like markings on it and now they're sat in front of you some of you will have a pen and you'll be twiddling and making doodles on it and stuff like that so everybody approaches a task differently and uses their own experience their own problem solving their own creative thoughts to be able to produce something around their own personal ideas and that I like to do this um, activity to highlight the fact that children that we work with will represent their own ideas in their own way, the same as you have all done with your paper aeroplanes. So keep your paper aeroplane some pin somewhere near your desk as a reminder of the fact that we are all individual and we all bring different experiences to whatever situation we're in and then we develop that going forwards. Okay. So, what we have to consider uh, working in early years, and one of the questions that I we are going to discuss in the breakout discussions in a little while, um, is are we in early years, are we taking that individuality and that idea of the children's own ideas, and are we displaying that creativity, or are we following a well-trod path, trodden path, and are we creating to display? Um, and particularly in this run up to this particular time of year, it's very pertinent, uh, where there is a tendency to say, right, we've all got to create a Christmas card, or we've all, we've seen something on, that's Pinterest perfect, and we want to recreate it. And because you've got an idea for a, a display board that's somewhere in the hallway and you want to cover it with something and actually my question to you would be are you celebrating creativity and doing that or do you have a young workforce production line for very work intensive expensive wallpaper um, because the process of developing something and 
it coming out the same as somebody else's or very similar to somebody else's um, can actually detract from the creativity of children and their ability to be able to express their own ideas. Um, these, if any of these displays are any of yours, I really apologise, they're ones that I've collected over the last 20 years of doing this, but these are examples, I think, of creating to display. So there's been an adult version of what something should look like, and every child or most children have been asked to participate in being part of that process. And what I would really like as an early years consultant to see is actually that process, that individuality, that ability to be creative is being celebrated in and around the, the setting and becomes part of your environment as much as uh, the actual learning that's going on. So that, you know, on, on this, you can see that we're making comments about the process that children are going through. We have galleries that celebrate the individualness of the ideas and what children have done. And also the fact that those are indoors and outdoors. So, we tend to get hung up with creativity being indoors in our creation station or on an easel or a sticking table. And actually, children are creative indoors and outdoors in their own way. Um, and if I go on to this next slide, then what I would like to get you to think about is the fact that I'm pretty sure that nobody told Van Gogh, here's a painting, you need to copy it. And yet we try and get those children to paint a specific thing. Whereas this little girl, she's exploring the paint, she's being creative and she will create something herself. What they did do with Van Gogh is they taught him skills. They taught him the skills to be able to explore with paint, to be able to explore with colour. And then he produced something that was about him, about him expressing himself in a particular way. And as humans, that's what we do. We express ourselves in a particular way creatively. It's one of the things that makes us stand out from lots of other um, animals and mammals. We're not the only ones that can be creative, but it's one of the ways that we stand out as humans. And so, for instance, what we tend to do is, I can't imagine that anybody told Banksy where he could be creative. Uh, it's a good job too, because otherwise people would be selling the walls for millions of pounds if they knew where it was going to happen. But he wouldn't be Banksy if he did it anywhere else. And yet, do we give children the opportunity to be creative, to explore those materials and that media and that ability to express themselves where they want to? Obviously within reason, because we never, none of us want to fall out with a caretaker. Um, and you know, writing on the walls isn't necessarily the best way forward. Um, but again, it's about thinking about the process. So it's about that process of exploring where you want to be creative. Um, and I think I'm hoping that this slide kind of um, enhances that. Um, the thing about creativity is it's not about the standard painting on an easel or the sticking a Christmas card on your sticking table in early years. It can come out through uh, role play. It can come out through songs, through music, through um, home corner play. It's, it, it, it can come out through block play. Um, and I don't think anybody ever told Michael Clark Duncan when he was playing John Kofi in Green Mile, I've used this one because he's one of my, one of my favourite portrayals. Um, they never really told him how he was going to play that character. And equally, if we give children enough of an open-ended approach to be able to role play, then they can be whoever they want to be, wherever they want, whenever they want. Um, and so it's about having the resources that allow you to be open-ended to let every individual child be who they want to be and express themselves the way that they want to be. And equally, I could have had slides with Darcy Bustle and children twirling, um, have people playing guitars, you know, um, Eric Clapton and the children making sounds. The thing with these people who are famous for being creative is that nobody told them exactly what they had to do. What they did was give them the skills and then let them express themselves through their own creativity. Um, in whichever way that they wanted to. 
And it's really important in early years that we praise the process that goes on and not just the end product. So we have to consider, are we only praising the end product, which is why I got the slide thinking about whether you're displaying creativity, or are we praising that process? Are we saying to children, that's a really lovely color of purple that you've got there that you on that painting. How did you manage to create that? Or I can see that you're, that was a brilliant dance that you just created there. And you know, what music were you listening to? And, and how did you come up with that idea? And you know, the young children, they are little children and they will tell you the process and they love the fact that you are acknowledging that creative process rather than it all being about trying to produce something that's perfect, in inverted commas, at the end, that they have to then compare against somebody else's version of perfect. So it's about praising that individual process. You've come up with a really good idea. You've expressed yourself really nicely. You have done this, you have done that. And making sure that we praise that process on a daily basis. How do we do that? How do we make sure that that happens? Is we enable our environment. And these, at the end, the bottom of these slides is the words that I think should be at the root of all early years. So we should enable our environment to engage the children so that they explore and then we enhance what they're doing as practitioners, because we are practitioners, we are not, we don't just throw stuff at them and hope some of it sticks. And then we, build on it, we are the scaffolding that helps to build on it and then we extend it. Um, so we take what we've seen and we offer extra things so that they can build on what they've already done. And what the first thing we can do to make this happen is we have to enable our environment with creativity in mind. Do we have an inspiring environment? Do we have one that really makes children want to engage with it, want to explore with it? want to explore their own creativity. So are there loose parts in there? Are there things that are exciting and engaging? And do we make it accessible? So is there stuff that is accessible on a daily basis that gives children the opportunity to make their own choices, to show their own ideas, to develop their own creations, to develop their own way of expressing themselves? And how do we look at making that accessible? And hopefully I've shown that in some of these slides um, to its best advantage. I could go on for hours doing this, so just bear with me. Um, once we've enabled our environment, then we have to engage the individual children. And that's the thing we have to remember. We also have to know our individual children. So when we're enabling our environment, we have to know our individual children. We need to know what they like, what makes them tick, what makes them excited. And we need to make sure that we've got those things in our environment. We need to look for that spark of excitement and creativity in each of those children and then we can follow them through that journey. Um, it could be anything from you know, the picture in the middle is the boys digging up bones in a box in the garden um, to the child on the right who is exploring an actual fish. It's a dead one, I have to say, from the fishmongers. Nobody died in the creation of that particular photo. Um, but it's about giving individual children the ability to express themselves in whichever way they feel um, is best for them. And not every child will express themselves through painting. Not every child will express themselves through music. Not every child will express themselves through drama. And it's about acknowledging that individualism and that individual way of expressing themselves. As we are as adults, we all have our preference to how we express ourselves um, creatively with our ideas. I write, other people might knit, crochet, paint, garden, whatever. Um, the children are the same. We shouldn't try and force them all to do exactly the same. And I know having a child who has autism how much he hated being made to do music um, every week as part of his class from early years up through primary. Absolutely hated it. Um, loves it now as a teenager, but it's we can't make them all fit into that same shaped box. We have to acknowledge when we're enabling our environments that we are trying to engage individual human beings. What we have to do once they are engaged is we as the practitioners have to then enhance that experience. So if we see somebody exploring paint like the little boy on the right is, then we 
look to add in extra colours, to add in extra things for him to paint on, uh, different brushes. Um, we are there, the one that's running around like a headless chicken, trying to make it even more of an immersive creative experience. Um, if they're build, building with blocks and they look like they're building a particular building and they tell you they're building something that they've seen or whatever, you know, we can run and we can get a photo of it and we can help with that creative process. So, um, you know, if the little girl is creating fairy potions, it, you know, you run around, you find a wand, you find the glittery stuff. It's about us facilitating their own ideas, their own imaginations, their own creativity rather than us having a preconceived idea of what should come out at the end of the conveyor belt. And then finally, what we have to do as practitioners is we have to extend that learning. We have to look at what we've seen. We have to know what we've seen. So we plan for the potential of learning to happen. And then we look for the learning. And then what we do is we take that and we think, how can we make that even more exciting, even more engaging? How can we build on what they've tried and what they what they found out? What, how can they take that further forward? And that's the same um, in so many professions that are to do with arts and crafts and design. Um, you know, architects try things, they don't work, they try again. Musicians try things, they don't work, they try again. Lots of famous artists quite, quite um, publicly have one painting underneath another. <laughs> because they've tried something and then they tried something else on top. So it, it's giving the children the, the opportunity to revisit those materials, revisit that media and build on and scaffold those brain connections that they're making and that ability to express their own ideas, their own creativity. And that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to unlock that creativity in all of the children that you're working with by enabling, engaging, enhancing and extending their environment so one of these state of the quotes that i heard i love sir ken robinson he's a loss to the to community um but one of the things that hit hardest with me when i was working with practitioners was that he said that our children and teachers are encouraged to follow routine algorithms rather than to excite that power of imagination and curiosity and I have to say that I think that is the case, unfortunately, but however, we work in early years and we have our own framework and our own framework legally says that we have to unlock a children's individual um, imaginations and creativity. The characteristics of effective learning have creativity and problem solving in them. We have a framework which is different to the rest of school in, in, in the UK. Um, in England and in Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland, they all have similar frameworks. And the early years allows you, if you do it right, to let children be creative themselves. Um, and one of the things I wanted to leave you with was the fact that when we were saying we enable the environment so that children can be creative, is a situation that I found myself in a good few years ago where I was working with an early years setting and there was a little boy and he wanted to do some painting and the painting paper had run out. So as an early years practitioner, what I tried to do was I tried to facilitate him being able to find something to paint on. And being me, I just went for some coloured paper in a completely different shape that was on a different table. And I brought it over and I went, ah, yes, look, you can paint on this purple triangle. Look, there's the paint there. I found some paper, I can't find any other paper. And he went, no, I can't paint on that. And I went, yes, you can, it's fine. Everybody will be fine, you'll be okay with that. No, I can't. I only can paint on the white rectangle paper. The colored triangle paper is for cutting and sticking. And I, to me, that made my heart break the fact that the routines and the, the constraint of what they were getting those children to do had taken away any element of his individual creativity and stopped him from potentially being the most amazing artist on that purple triangle of paper. Um, so we need to think about what we're saying and what we're doing and how 
unfortunately, as much as it can grow the potential for creativity, it can also knock the stuff in out of children and stop them being creative from a very early age. Um, and we have to hold our hands up and be responsible for that um, and say, no, that's not happening anymore. So I'm going to leave you with this um, that a, a colleague of mine came up with uh, years ago when I worked with her, the lovely Penny Vine says, accept all outcomes and value all responses. So that's really important that whatever the children are doing, it's OK. It's them being creative. It's them using their imaginations. And it is them developing their own learning for life, because when they go forward into that world that we're not ever going to know, um, then they are going to be asked to not just think inside the box, but outside the box, on the box, next to the box and halfway down the street to the box. We just don't know. We need to give them the lifelong learning love of being creative to know that it's OK to be them, it's OK to be individual and it's OK to own the process and not just be focused on the product.